Epidemic lockdowns lead to rise in female genital mutilation in Somaliland. In Somaliland, female genital mutilation or FGM cases increased during the, uh, you know, the big disease that's going around. I'm going to have to use a little bit of code language for this because of YouTube, but uh, the lockdowns. Safia Ibrahim, a cutter who performs the barbaric act of genital mutilation, has taken advantage of the lockdown. Knowing that girls will likely be home, Ibrahim has been going door to door during the pandemic asking parents, have your daughters been cut? In January 2022, the World Health Organization, or WHO, released a statement affirming the harm caused by FGM and its lack of medical benefits. According to the United Nations Population Fund, in 2021, due to the pandemic, 2 million more cases of FGM that could otherwise have been averted will occur over the next decade. Uh, the United Nations Population Fund, or UNFPA for short, estimated that 98% of women and girls aged 15 to 49 have undergone some form of FGM across Somalia and Somaliland. Edna Andan Ismail, Somaliland's former first lady, gave a fiery speech during the February 6th International Day of Zero Tolerance for FGM. In contrast, uh, Abdi Razak, uh, Abdi Razak, Hussein Ali Al Albani, the Minister of Religious Affairs for Somaliland, supports a milder version of FGM. It's insane. Is there anything that could be done about this? No, right? Because I don't know. Is there any pressure? Well, that... so Somaliland is like a de facto state that is kind of trying to seek its own recognition. I don't think there's any country that actually recognizes Somaliland as its own nation. But, you know, this is, they're kind of, they have, you know, all these kind of these different state entities. Anyways, um, in Somaliland, it, it, there is no prohibitions on FGM. There have been pushes to make it illegal, but every, my understanding is that every single member of the government is male. And so whenever there are pushes based on women who are profiled in a, a, a write-up of this that you know I saw, um, every time they make some progress, at the end of the line, they, they always defer to some imam. And the imam will say, oh, no, 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 we can't have, we can't prohibit this. We have to keep allowing it. I can't imagine how painful this must be. Wait, did they use any anesthesia or like? So in this profile that, you know, followed this, uh, or th this profile, a cutter, um, this woman has been performing FGM since she was 15 herself. And um, she, they, she demonstrated like using someone's hand. She didn't actually do it. She kind of just, you know, showed what it would be doing faux motions. Um, that she applies anesthetic with a syringe to the area and then goes ahead and do, does it. But the anesthetic is a relatively new addition to the procedure that she's been doing for the past, like, um, imagine having several a decades. sharp object at your genital going at your genitals. Like, how is this not? How is the entire world not united against this? This should be a this should be a crime everywhere. Like this should be like a this is one of the by the way the genital mutilation of both boys and girls. I I know people think I'm exaggerating when I'm saying this, but this is one of the greatest human rights violations of our time right now. Oh yeah. Okay. It is, and it's so normalized. And I, you know, people like are, I mean, people are, get traumatized and get a lot of reaction when they do it to girls, but it's also, it's also a human rights violation when they're doing it to boys. And the boys' situation is even worse because it doesn't even get a reaction. And you know, yeah. you know, I think like a lot of countries who are feel like they are a lot more civilized. And they look at Somaliland and they consider this backwards. I mean, how is this more barbaric than the, what they're doing, what is legal in these, so, these civilized countries? How is this more barbaric than the genital mutilation that they're doing to boys? So I know they, like people they could argue that this is worse because at least with the circumcision of boys, you have the benefit of infantile amnesia. 
because it happens so soon after birth that you're not going to remember it. But this usually so happens to girls between the ages of seven and up, five to seven and up. So they'll be fully conscious and aware and fully remember the traumatic experience. So that's not something I uh, believe. But yeah, so that's bull that's bull crap because if I if I like capture you and I torture you and then I wipe your memory, you, I still you still experience torture. The fact that you don't remember it doesn't mean that you didn't go through hell while you were experiencing it, right? So that's a dumb excuse, right? I mean, I know you didn't say that, but anyway, you were saying in the left hand, there's actually a movement of parents in Israel that don't circumcise. Oh, good. Awesome. Well, I mean, I mean, I hope that movement matures to not just not moves beyond just not circumcising. I think there should be a push to make this illegal. Okay, make this a crime. Okay. Um, and I think the situation for boys is actually worse than girls. I know on an individual basis, circumcision of girls is worse than, you know, the, the mutilation, genital mutilation of girls is worse than the genital mutilation of boys, you know? The damage is like more, that's what I heard. But on an aggregate basis, the boys are suffering a lot more from genital mutilation than girls. Like the aggregate pain that boys, infant boys are experiencing is astronomically higher than, so like, I don't want people to look at this and be like, oh my God, this is happening in like backward countries like in Somalia. No, this, this, this stuff is legal in the United States. It's just legal to boys, for, to, to, to boys in the most advanced countries in the world. This is like the most civilized countries in the world. This is legal. Well, it's also not federally at, illegal to do this to girls in the U.S. either. Wow. Okay. So there's that as well. But yeah. Um, yeah. And also it's more normalized. Mm -hmm. it, I you know, like people are shocked when it's done to girls, but they're not shocked when they say like, guys, you're putting sharp objects at genitals of infants the most helpless people in, in our society you're taking sharp objects and you're cutting them on their genitals this is like like the more i the more you think about this the more insane and barbaric it sounds how did this become normalized the only it's because of religion that this got normalized this should this should become a crime there's like when eventually this becomes a crime future generations are going to look at what we were doing with horror they could not believe how many people just went with this. They're well, like, appropriately they so. Yeah, they should be, I mean, appropriately horrified, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They, they should be horrified. Yeah. Um, what I, I wanted to highlight this because we haven't talked about the issue of genital mutilation uh, on this show for a while. And I remember when the um, lockdowns first started to happen, we covered this and talked about how this is going to become an issue and going to allow for um, this to even be amplified in a lot of areas of the world. And then this article came out in the AP that really highlighted that they're seeing the evidence of that already. Um, and I also wanted to cover it because, you know, it's always a good opportunity to talk about how our attitudes about this are very sexist, um, where, you know, we're all pretty openly horrified when it happens to women, but then when it happens to men, people are like, oh yeah, like, why are you making that a big deal? It's like weird that you would like compare the two. Um, and also I think, um, oh shoot, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, I remember. Um, one thing I don't understand. So, or maybe you have a little bit more knowledge or understanding of this. So I know that the religious idea behind men getting circumcised is that this is a continuation of the covenant. You know, the God of Abraham d demands blood sacrifice. And that this is, you know, you, you carrying on that covenant that we have with God. Um, but the, the idea behind the general mutilation of women in Islam has never made a lot of sense to me because my understanding is it doesn't come out of any burden for continuation of the covenant that it's based on very specific hadith or Islamic scripture about what the prophet said, basically like this is permissible, but like too much is not good. Um, but if that's the case, it's not about, you know, the covenant, like I said, what doesn't make sense to me is, isn't Allah's creation supposed to be perfect? 
So why would you be cutting off and removing these things from which Allah has designed perfectly? I don't understand. Um, I mean, it's, it's supposed, I mean, the, the obvious answer to that is going to be like, it was the perfect test. The leads are like, God is not, God creates everything perfectly, but it's not going to be perfect for you. If it's like things that you have to do is because everything is a perfect test. I don't understand. Like for example, wouldn't it so be for more example, of a test to it, have the sexual pleasure available to you and you restrain yourself no, from like, pursuing that sexual no, pleasure instead of having God it knows, butchered off of your body? So you're being an arrogant mortal thinking that you know better than God what the best plan would be. That's what the answer would be. Like, for example, it's kind of like saying, like, why, if God's creation is perfect, then why do we get heart disease? I'm like, well, God made sure that you get heart disease because he has a plan for you for why he gives you heart disease. You know what I mean? So it's perfect, but you don't understand you with your limited human brain would never understand why it's perfect. But it that is seems perfect. very That's different good. to me, just having like a congenital disease versus taking manual steps to the idea is that everything is perfect because altering the body in other ways. Okay, you don't understand how this works. Susanna. You have to just the idea is that you just have to trust that God knows best. That's you know, you can't just like argue your way. Like, well, if I was Allah, I would do this. They're like, guys, you don't have the level of knowledge and understanding that Allah has. Obviously, Allah knows what would be best. So that's what the answer would be, right? Um, that would be, that's the answer to everything, actually. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so you don't question it. You don't question it. Yeah. Um, Joe is saying orgasm is a congenital disease. Get it, Susanna? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and you was um, saying to the best of my understanding female genital mutilation is not an islamic duty and they're actually fought was against it yes it depends a lot on the madhab the school of thought but um wow. it's the shafi shafi um oh my school God. of thought that says that it's actually mandatory or obligatory and there are others that just say it's recommended like, I forget the word for it, but there's a word for when it's just recommended or a permissible. And then there's one more that I think says it's actually forbidden. But for the Shafi okay. school, it's huge in North Africa, parts of India, and Indonesia. You know what? I'm just going to leave. Why am I, like, Susanna has all the information. Like, why am I even here? Okay. Like I didn't, I was going to give you some information that was supposed to impress you, but it's not, it wasn't going to be as impressive because she has more details on this. Than I. I'm the ex-Muslim here, Susanna. You're the ex-Christian. You're not supposed to know all of this. I was going to say to you, I was going to respond to you, I'm going to say like, I don't know which school I know. I just know like three of them recommended. One of them makes it mandatory, but you actually know the, which ones. <laughs> like, which one, like, this is not cool. Like I am not like I've been doing this for 15 years. Okay. And you've been doing this for two and I'm the ex Muslim and you know, more details. You have more information about this than I do. This is like, I'm like, I've been being put to shame here. This Further proof that I am just, I'm a secret Muslim. All along. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Okay. So, but yes, yeah, Susanna, Susanna said like, it really depends on the school. Uh, there's four different mashabs or schools of thought in Sunni Islam. So uh, you will, it really depends on which, which one you're referring to. Um, I don't think she has have that. Um, I know in some places in Iran, they do it, but I don't know what they're referring to Islamically when they do that. But I know like in Sunni Islam, it is encouraged, even if it's not mandatory, you know? Um, so there's that. And yeah, the goal is to reduce the pleasure. It reduces basically, it, it makes, women behave more better if they're not feeling if they don't have if they have less sexual desires so that's the motivation behind it that's our understanding it's yeah. so horrific i was reading accounts of how what happens to women on their wedding nights they literally have to be cut back open before their husbands can initiate sex with them and then like yeah. If you read someone's like people's first hands account of what happened to them, it's it's horrific. Like I don't even have words. 
So you will you're you're referring to somebody from Al Azhar University has who spoke against it. Okay, but having an individual from Al Azhar University is very insignificant from having an entire, um, you know, madhab. Like we have four like different madhab in Sunni Islam that they have precedent and they have tradition of advocating for this. Okay, so that is very insignificant compared to a, a, a huge see of what they call Islamic scholarship that says this as sees this as okay and even recommend it right uh, so if you j like just be careful just because like a lot of Muslims uh, a lot of people who want to make um, arguments in favor of Islam and make it seem less bad they just go find that one person that says something they like and they zoom on that so be careful about that that, that happening yeah um, yeah I know okay so yeah it's a grand mufti of Egypt but again he, there are throughout the Islamic history, we have had m major figures who had said things, major figures who had say, said things that are not part of mainstream understanding of Islam. So this would be nothing new, right? Like when Ghazali said and came and said a whole bunch of heretical stuff, um, that doesn't mean that mainstream orthodox Islamic understanding was not, I mean, you, you, how, you can't get more major than Ghazali at his time. But he was still understood to be some, saying something that is not according to, uh, not uh, in contradiction to what is considered mainstream Islam, right? Even though Ghazali was somebody who's setting new precedents about what is Islamic, it's still like, you know, you can't just point to one individual and be like, oh, he's a grand mufti, therefore this is what's okay, right? This is what is Islamic. It's a it's a huge battle of ideology. Like it's like a it's a it's a mess, right? And you have to look at instead of looking at one individual and make deciding whether or not this is what the precedent is or this is what the norm is you have to look at all these ideological battles between different groups at the same time right um there was okay here you you wanted to highlight this susan i see, i saw you started oh yes thank you for reminding me uh, while we're on the topic of this uh discussing this topic, I think it's very important that Secular Sakai brought this up. The Ion Hersi Ali Foundation has a 24-7 hotline to ask for emergency help against FGM. So I think we should take a moment to advertise that and recognize it. The Ion Hersi Ali Foundation is one of the preeminent organizations in the United States fighting FGM. And so I really, really celebrate their work. Uh, you want to read this one? Uh, Scruffy is saying, how can an action that is innately immoral harming others be accepted among humanity? Yeah, I know, right? Also, uh, you know, both of the reasoning for male uh, genital mutilation is uh, and female genital, genital mutilation is insane, right? But it's amazing how, it's amazing how, like, I don't know if I should say this, but the fact that you want the woman in your life to have less joy from having sex so that you reduce the risk of them going and do something you don't like but but they're also going to have less joy when, with having sex with you like doesn't that like how does that not reduce like don't people get joy from sex from knowing how much joy the other person is getting from the sex like isn't that like a major part of the joy like from most sex? people most men yeah. I know say that the most reward they actually get out of the experience of it is seen. It's very rewarding and like ego filling to know how much yeah. pleasure you're bringing to someone in that way. It makes how you feel like, yeah, I'm, you're, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but how, how, how much, how self-centered and without care do you have to be that you don't like when you're having sex you're just looking at you don't care about the <laughs> feelings that you're that you're bringing upon the person you just look at like you, you just want to hold to stick it in like what is the like <laughs> well i mean you do want to i just i don't understand i just don't understand like these people okay i don't i'm going to stop well, talking because I'm saying saying is, <laughs> can't relate <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh maybe it's because i bring so much joy to whoever i have sex with and maybe these people have never experienced that so that's why they can't relate right. yeah 
Hey guys, if you're a fan of Blasphemy and Sexy Callie, you know, like me, then you need to be sure to subscribe to our newsletter. Link in the description below. Because if you subscribe, we will send you a free copy of our Blasphemous Art ebook. And let me tell you, it is the tastiest Blasphemy that you can find anywhere available today. And we are so generous with our Blasphemy that we continue to send you more Blasphemy every week. So make sure to subscribe. Link in the description below.